Welcome. We're going to be doing substitutions today. This is a form of lambda calculus. We're going to get as far as defining what functions are in the view of lambda calculus and what variables are. Before this, you might want to take a look at the previous lecture on what the fuss is all about. Why do we even need a lambda calculus? Surely we've been substituting since elementary school. What notions do we need to strengthen? And the answer is, even simple things like constant functions and identity functions get confusing if we don't set down some rules. So in this, we're going to describe what makes a variable and then what makes a function. And we can start with something that looks straightforward. We have four lines of code in a familiar looking programming language. We have c set to 4, f of x equal to 3x plus 2. We evaluate f at c and get 14. We're not interested in the functions so much as we're interested in what the roles of x and c have to do with things. Are these both variables? The main thing we need to articulate in the lambda calculus is the role of variables separate from the role of functions. And we'll get there in three phases. The first is simply to say that a variable will simply be a symbol that we're going to replace. And we'll see how in a couple of lectures. Formulas, on the other hand, are going to be strings that involve variables. I have not said functions yet. I want to reserve that precisely for a meaning that will come later. So what are the variables in x plus 5? Certainly there's a familiar one, x. It feels like a variable. We've been taught it for many years. If I replace x with 3, then I know that I've changed this to a new meaning, 3 plus 5. x is indeed behaving like a variable. But there are others that are a little bit more confusing when you first see them, but equally valid. While we think of 5 as a constant, there are situations where we think of 5 as a replaceable constant. For example, we might have interpreted our problem as involving matrices. At this point, 5 is just a placeholder for something like the 5 matrix on the diagonal. Likewise, the numbers 1 and minus 1 and 0 can also play a variable role. We'll get to what that means when we define sorts of variables. We may not, for example, want to replace 5 with the letter pi, but nevertheless, it is variable in that we will replace it with other symbols to make the logic make sense. And there's another label in here that is surprisingly a variable, the plus sign. If we're going to dabble with replacing things with matrices, then addition will have to be replaced with an addition of matrices, or addition of polynomials, and if you've seen abstract algebra, additions of many other kinds. What we need to think about is that any symbol, in some sense, has the right to be a variable, if the context permits it. And this leads us to the key idea. Language itself is what will describe what makes a variable. We can't come to a notion of variable separate from simply allowing the rules of the language to tell us. In arithmetic, we usually let symbols like x, y, a, b, c, and so forth represent the variables, and they're usually substituting for constant numbers that we'll come to whenever solving a problem. Geometry will ask us to look at different labels. The letter L for a line, capital P and Q for points, these are common variable names in geometry, and we know them by agreement in the language. In abstract algebra, we may have familiar variables as we see in polynomial equations, x, y's, z's, and the like. But we'll also add to this the ability to replace the numbers, or those symbols, plus and minus, even the equal sign and zero. These become variable to an abstract algebra, they allow us to change the number systems while still looking at the very same equations. That way we can study how do we solve equations without even knowing what number system we're thinking about. That's the abstraction in the abstract algebra. Similarly, there's a version of geometry which seeks to abstract over the concepts of lines and points and intersections. This is a form sometimes known as synthetic geometry. Here, we have the familiar names of lines and points but we now also abstract the concepts of perpendicular and parallel and angle. They take on a meaning relevant to what we are synthesizing, what we've created as our new abstract geometry. It no longer has to relate to the space that we live in. Further mathematics and sciences in general do similar things with their languages. Our last example will be one from category theory to demonstrate that we now take the symbols capital A, capital B, which might represent sets or groups or modules, 
and think of them purely as variables. And even we think of arrows and implications and products and coproducts as variable too. Each new context imbues them with a meaning relevant to the context. In that way, they really will be substituted for with specific context. They are variables. All sorts of variables exist, and even the word sort becomes a word we need to learn as a formal meaning. Notice, for example, in a formula like x plus 5, while I think of x and plus and 5 as being variables depending on context, I would rarely replace the plus sign with the number 5. I wouldn't replace x with a plus sign either. The roles of these variables are distinct. It's as if they're sorted into different parts of the logic. When we need to sort our variables, we do this at the level of our language. We agree that operations plus and minus should not be intermingled with variables like x and y, even if both can play the role of a variable. This leads us to make a distinction between two types of logic. In a propositional logic, one that assigns things to being true and false, it doesn't need to have any individual sorts. We can simply say every variable can be replaced with an arbitrary symbol in the language. This allows us the most freedom, but it also is the most distinct from what we do in our daily lives, where we do separate concerns. Predicate logic, on the other hand, usually implies that there is a sorting of the variables, and often within a hierarchy. For example, we may have defined constants in this language, 1, 5, even the symbol pi can be provided by our language as a constant, provided the language rules insist that this is, for example, 3.14 or whatever the circumference divided by diameter is. It's allowed to have constants that don't have a meaning in terms of decimal representations. They can have a meaning in the language. Then separate variables could be replaced with values that are relations. This is how we would deal with pluses, equals, and less thans being separate from constants like 1, 5, and pi. We would use different variable symbols. And we make a tower out of this if we then include relations on relations. For example, a subset is a relation on a relation, because the set itself is a relation, the relation of all the terms in the set. So subsets become a tower of implications. Equivalences between sets, isomorphisms, can also climb the tower, and we get a much richer structure, but harder to sort out some of the fine details. Whether you use these language or not, it's helpful to understand where they're coming from and why people insert these differences. Propositional logic is usually the simpler on the tower. Predicate logic requires some finesse, but it also is more re uh, representative of what we're actually doing. Finally, we come to our terms that let us describe what a function is. Our goal was to think about variables solely for functions, but we should acknowledge that variables are used in other ways. In particular, it's not enough to tell me the variable letters to know what I mean to do with them. For example, the sum from 1 to 100 uses the variable i solely as a placeholder to indicate how we will create the logically implied sum. For all x is choosing to think of x as a parameter that will change through an entire context, a universe. Whereas x maps to x plus 3 is the first example on this page of a genuine function, a place where x is to be substituted by the user and not by the rules of the logic. This leads us to think of two types of variables within any logical system. That is, we could have sorted or unsorted logics and still have these two concepts. Free variables are ones where we don't have an assigned logical connective. a squared plus b squared equals c squared. This may or may not be true. We don't know what a, b, and c are. We can make no judgment. The variables a, b, and c here have no meaning, and therefore we can't say very much. They are unbound. They're free variables. The next line, x maps to x plus c, contains a mixture of two types of variables. The letter c is not being used anywhere in that formula except to appear in the plus c part. It is free. We could replace it with, for example, 5 or 7 or pi. However, x, we will see, is bound. In the sentence n is even, we again cannot decide if n is even or not. We don't know because we've given no context clues about n. We need a logical connective. For every n is n even, for some n is n even, those would be enough. But as it stands, the letter n is a free variable.
When we now move to bound variables, we can see the comparison more starkly. Whenever our logic has some syntax or semantics that allows us to connect variables with formulas, we are able to decide that the variable is now bound. In the map x goes to x plus 5, we are binding the variable x to the formula x plus 5. We have explained to the reader that x will now play the role of something we substitute. Whereas in the next line, for all k, 2k is even, we're binding the variable k to the formula 2k is even. And it is either true or false at this point. There exists an x such that x squared minus 1 equals 0 is similarly binding x to the formula x squared minus 1 equals 0. In the last line, we have the variable i, which is bound by the summation symbol. Each of these binds a different meaning of what we want to do with the variable. Having bound variables, we now can determine what it means to be a function, at least from the perspective of the lambda calculus. This is what Alonzo Church invented for us, and his notation initially copied some of the other notations in logic. For example, it's familiar in logic to write for all x and then put the formula, or there exists x. And likewise, he chose the letter lambda to introduce functions. We may never know why. Today, we generally write a more categorical language with arrows, thinking of a process that's moving the value x into the formula p of x. That may not make sense in every function, but it's very popular all the same. Nevertheless, these are still called lambdas. Whenever you have x plus 5 as a formula and you bind it by the arrow, you have created a function of that variable. For the moment, we'll do this one variable at a time, and if we need multiple variables, we'll simply nest the arrows one after the other after the other. It'll combine to all the usual notions of functions in a process called currying. Whether you call these lambdas or anonymous, they're always called functions. But be aware that many contexts will use the words anonymous functions or lambdas when they're trying to indicate that they have a function of this kind without explaining its name. That's where the word anonymous comes from. For example, we haven't called it f of x. So now we get to our summary point. Variables are symbols we can replace. Formulas with strings of variables are, or formulas are strings that contain variables. But functions are formulas that are bound with a lambda, or with an arrow if the symbol is being used. This is the only way we can distinguish variable use as a function from all the many other uses of variables. Formulas by themselves we shall not treat as functions, unless they have bound the variable by a lambda, or equivalently an arrow. With this definition in place, we can start to explore our original example. What in the variables here, which of the symbols here are really variables? X is clearly a variable in line 2. It's being used in the role of being replaceable. It's written with a notation where we've named the function, but we could just as well have replaced it with x maps to 3x plus 2. That's the implied meaning of line 2, replacing x to evaluate f. But here's a way to know that c is not a variable. We are not thinking of 4 as a function of c. We don't replace c with, for example, pi and find pi equal to 4. c is not a variable even though it is very common to say so, especially in versions of programming languages, we'll talk about assigning the variable c the value 4, replacing the variable, passing a variable. These are actually a misuse of the word variable. They're rather more describing naming a constant or naming a formula. We are just simply defining the symbol c to mean whatever's on the other side. If you keep this distinction in mind, it won't really matter whether you call c a variable to yourself or to others, but there is clearly a difference between describing a function and using it to simply name. c in this role is not what a logician would call a variable, and it's questionable as to whether it should be called a variable as programming, except to get along with the common sense language. If you'd like to see more, there's a wonderful online guide connected here to the Stanford Resources on Philosophy, as well as a wonderful book which contains not only Lambda Calculus, but also Combinators. In a future lecture, we'll describe the Combinator approach, which is another equivalent way to describe functions from very basic parts. It's much closer to, say, how a computer chipset 
has a bunch of standard instructions that we just assume are correct functions, and everything else is built by combining them together. It's an adequate way which perfectly naturally parallels the two modes of thinking. Lambda calculus is universal programming, whereas combinators is more like universal computing. Thank you.